but I do think that there needs to then be underlying a biological meaningfulness of this differentiation. And I mean, for example, if you look at the term secondary progressive, and Pat Coyle already introduced the term, it's an individual that had relapsing remitting disease that now has some inflammatory events, relapse or uh, new lesions on the brain MRI, but has also progression of disability in between. If you now have a patient that is successfully treated with an immune modulator, you may also have a patient that has a little bit of progression that breaks through. Is that person having truly secondary progressive disease or is this just a residual of the prior injuries that you have in this individual? Well, I think this gets into the issue that it can be difficult for clinicians to tell when a relapsing patient has truly transitioned to secondary progressive disease. I would mention, I think most people would support that, progress, that progressive MS is neurodegenerative MS, that there is some biological underpinnings to slow worsening MS, the neurodegenerative phase of the right. disease. So this, I wanted to go there right now. I'm, I'm glad you took us there. The most common form of MS is what, with all these acronyms? Relapsing, relapsing remitting. The one you don't like, the name you don't right. like. 85 to 90 percent starts out as relapsing MS. And then a percentage of those patients with that RRMS transition yes. to SPMS. Yes. yes. What is that? Why do they do that? What percent do that? And what does that imply for their quality of life? So the percentage appears to be falling in the modern era with treatment. There are increasing studies that are saying uh, treatment versus no treatment, early treatment versus late treatment, stronger treatment significantly decreases the proportion transitioning to secondary progressive MS. Whether they're delaying it just or preventing it, we don't know. We need but to follow long enough. If you delay it long enough, it's the same as preventing it. Well, absolutely right. But the interesting thing is progressive MS is age-linked, age-linked, mid-40s, about 45 to 50. There's something about that midlife age where you have the association of gradual worsening. And I think to me, without, without documentation, the most likely is the neurodegenerative damage of MS is silent for a number of years. But at some point, you have enough neurodegenerative injury that you see the clinical expression of slow worsening. I right. think so. At midlife, that would be suggestive to me. Don't, don't do you think? Yeah, don't? so that would be then a matter of duration of the disease in many of these individuals where an unchecked disease will have created so much injury right. that now there is a progression because of the inability of the, of the brain to compensate. Right. This is also why early treatment may be key in controlling comorbid conditions and having a wellness, healthy lifestyle. I mean, look, we can put this on the table. I have yet to see a disease that wouldn't be made better by control of cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar. So well, those are just generic, but generic that it's important, right? Yeah. Well, there's also a plethora of data that shows that if you can maintain your EDSS at less than or equal to three versus greater than three, there's a huge impact on not only cost, but symptoms, uh, comorbidities, all the things we're trying to prevent downstream. But I find it fascinating as we get into the different forms of MS, can we get agreement, uh, you know, guidelines, consensus in terms of what is the profile of somebody with relapsing versus secondary progressive versus primary progressive. So uh, these different uh, disease states in the absence of a true biomarker. I think the FDA has tried to build a buffer between the purely progressive forms of multiple sclerosis and the relapsing forms mm -hmm. of multiple mm -hmm. sclerosis. I haven't said remitting, right? <laughs> I have uh, omitted okay. the, 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 the curse word for today. Uh, and has called out specifically the active secondary progressive, with active secondary progressive presence of either new MRI lesions or attacks in an individual versus the patients that is what I sometimes call the dwindler the individuals that just has progression uh, to call that out as a, as a sec uh, separate form. I just will caution in that this 
very often means that the patient at that time is not on treatment or uh, it becomes more difficult to evaluate this if a patient is on ongoing treatment because what would this patient be if the agent were not modifying the disease? I was actually very surprised that the FDA went there, to be honest. I was surprised that they said active SPMS is a relapsing form of MS. Clearly, we, we accept that. Well, is SPMS different than RMS? Well, look, SPMS started out as relapsing MS, and there's a transition period. Some people have suggested it's about five years. Relapses and the MRI marker of that, contrast-enhancing lesions, is related to young age and early MS disease duration. So clinical attacks and contrast-enhancing lesions become less and less common the older you get and the longer you have MS. So what percent of patients, all comers, uh, are diagnosed with SPMS? So that's a shifting field in many large... How did I know you were going to say that? In many, in many large centers, you might have upwards of 30% hitting secondary progressive MS. But, but over time, in the treatment era, the SPMS group seems to be shrinking a bit. Uh, would, would you agree, I agree with that? I agree with that. And many of the data that we have are of long-term cohorts that include patients that were never on treatment, only partially on treatment. Uh, I think it's very important, and since this is a conversation also to around payer uh, points to all of this. We have in, in, in all of these patient groups that are highly vulnerable to be on, off, on, off, on, off treatments, particularly Medicaid patients. Keep in mind that uh, in the Medicaid population, only about 20% of patients are continuously for five years on medication 